ಚಂದ್ರಾಧಿಕಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಭಕ್ತ ತಕ್ತ ನಮೋ ನಮ ಸೊ ಅಗೇನ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಯು ಫ್ರಮ್ ನಾರ್ತ್ ಕರ್ಲೈನ ಅನಂದಾಶ್ರಮ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಹಿಯರ್ arrived here yesterday from Arkansas as you may recall last week we did our last Easter ghost day from from a rocky place very interesting cave and I was invited to stream from so we had a very interesting retreat with a group of Vaishnavas and leaders and friends and brothers and sisters getting together and thinking together and feeling together in terms of uh what what what's our contribution what's the necessary contribution in our times for the godia sampradaya as a whole and for extended society and planet and humanity as it as well right so it's always very powerful very inspiring very necessary to to gather hmm? this type of templates are present always in all traditions all cultures from time immemorial the importance of <clears throat> making time to sit together uh to look at each other's face like we are trying to do here although we are not in a physical circle but somehow or other is the closest we can get by the help of technology trying to get together and look at each other's face and eyes and accompany each other's heart in the journey and allow each other to have a voice basically you know like like invite each one of us to to be all that we can be today to to embrace the opportunity of individuation basically of 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 cultivating further uh appreciation for for depth so to say together um getting closer and closer to this epiphany to this realization that basically uh, as a veda say vasudhaiva kutumbakam which is basically means there is only one family mm-hmm. which again sounds nice sounds poetic sounds romantic sounds idyllic sounds so many things but we need to have an experience of that to realize there is only one family technically strictly objectively speaking <laughs> in other words in the words of uh other richer roar that as you know i had the chance of visiting him two weeks ago he will say everything belongs and i really like not only that book but that quote because sometimes as we as i mentioned in the radical personalism we are just struggling to fit in to fit in in a social circle to fit in in reality to fit in with ourselves to fit in in our relationship with god but it's all many times about fitting in which basically implies forcing ourselves out of who we actually are uh, invoking a false sense of identity and creating therefore a fracture a duality a dichotomy uh, instead of embracing the unity and the relationality of everything so so the actual pattern is not so much everything is divided and fragmented and therefore i have to divide myself to fit in somehow but the actual truth is uh we are we already belong not only we already belong to this common center but all of us belong to that common center and therefore everything belongs instead of i'm struggling to fit in to everything belongs that's that's a journey of course <laughs> we are traversing that journey and it may take some time to get to that point of experience where we realize actually everything belongs everything already belongs everything already is connected to to this common center to this common sweet absolute and therefore vasudhaiva kutumbakam there's only one family that's another way of saying everything belongs <clears throat> or sambandha everything is interconnected so again this gatherings every saturday hopefully as i was saying that day in our 
Thursday gatherings in Spanish. We have our Spanish Estagosti as well. <clears throat> We're talking how these are not, at least not for me, not ordinary gatherings, not ordinary moments, not just a casual weekly affair that at, at one point it ends up becoming like mechanical or like ordinary or like, okay, yeah, let's go for the Sunday, Saturday, Easter goes to like a formal thing. But it's a very important uh, portal, hopefully for all of us to get a glimpse of this point, to get a glimpse of this all encompassing one family we belong to and to get closer and closer to this, to this feeling, to this experience. That there is actually no separatedness among any of us. That creates actual family. That creates actual community. But first, we have to realize the communion aspect. We have to realize how everything somehow or other is in communion with the divine. Everything is already connected. And when that communion is properly conceived and established, then we can speak about community uh, on the foundation of this common unity, common connection. So anyhow, for me, this, this, these are important moments of my life, of my week, of my day today, so we can increase our proximity to this experience and realization, which can always, of course, grow more and more and more. So uh, thank you so much to all of you for being here and giving me the chance of um, having my own experience and getting closer and closer to that. Hopefully that's also part of the experience of each one of us. So anyhow, brief introduction, as usual, we share a few words of what has been happening this last week or days since our last Istragosti. Uh, so after that, I see a few hands raised already, a few more than ever. <laughs> so better I stop my introduction and we go to to whatever questions you may have or topics of things you may like to hear more about. So I always say it doesn't necessarily have to be an official question, but it can be just the interest, the curiosity or the necessity to hear more about any anything, some particular theme, some particular situation we may be going through. And we may need some uh, additional exploration or articulation in in tribe, so to say, which is very different from what we can do by ourselves. Now we can try to figure out things on our own. And of course, it's important to exercise discernment and so on. But when certain topics have been brought to the table in the context of community and, and family and Sangha, Tadatmya Sangha in this case, uh, there's always some new light that can be shed, some newer perspectives. Some, we, we can be so much enriched by each other's uh, thought and experiences. So that's part of the attempt here as well. So that said, we, I'm seeing Kevin raising his hand first, and then we have some other five in the in the queue. So please, Kevin, you can unmute yourself and share share what, what you have today in mind and, and heart. Thank you so much. Good morning. And uh, I'm glad to see that you've made it safely to North Carolina. And um, my question hopefully will not be too uh, detailed or need too detailed of a response. But um, sometimes when I'm listening to talks or reading different texts, I hear phrases that it almost feels like it's a type of secret code, like among devotees or among community. And, and it's hard for me to understand the phrase sometimes. So, I mean, if I'm honest with myself, I, I, I don't understand the full meaning or maybe more accurately, the layers of meaning that are being communicated between the text and and the reader or between devotees uh, themselves. So the phrase that I'm talking about right now that's kind of stumped me uh, is the lotus feet of Krishna. You know, I hear it used in expressions like surrender to the lotus feet or that's an offense to the lotus feet or the sweet lotus feet as a, you know, I would more likely hear it in a Western context is surrender to this deity, surrender to Jesus or surrender to God, you know, versus surrender to the lotus feet. So 
I'm just wondering, and then there are the marks that are on the lotus feet. And, I, you know, I'm just wondering, it has to mean something that I'm not getting. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you could just speak a little to help yes. me with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, <clears throat> so you started your question by mentioning that there are, to be honest, there are many things that I don't get and there are many layers of, of, of these interactions that are beyond my grasp, you mentioned, and I was feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm, I could also say this, the exact same thing, you know? maybe on, on another level, and I'm not saying I'm in a higher level, on a different level, on, or not level, but on a, from a different perspective, uh, each one of us are, so, so to say, eternally coexisting with, with the mystery of depth. You know? I mean, things have a depth which is endless and boundless. Therefore, there's always some layers of mystery waiting for us there, no matter how advanced we are. That's my point. Of course, we we need to understand some things and to penetrate certain conundrums or enigmas or puzzle-like expressions and situations. That's how we go through life and we, we can advance in our journey. But the point is, it will never we will never reach a point where everything is absolutely figurable. So to say, now, like now I understand absolutely everything in its utmost biggest degree. There is nothing left for me to, to figure out that, I mean, that's the ultimate illusion basically, <laughs> or the ultimate arrogance, if you will, in connection to the infinite. How can you dare to say such a thing? Mm -hmm. That's that's what Srila Siddhar Maharaj will always say that I love. The closer we get to the infinite, the more we will realize there is no limit to progress because you are facing something that has no beginning, no end, in depth, in breadth, in, breadth, in every direction. So, I mean, it's endless. So how, how we can try to fully understand. So I, I, I'm saying that as a foundational point in my reply, which I think is very important for us to keep in mind all throughout our journey. <laughs> <laughs> so so even when you reach the ultimate goal so to say you can your eternal spiritual identity will be embedded in that spirit mm -hmm. to the point that you go to you see the the mood or the example of the devotees in Vrindavan for example the Brajavasis and they don't feel they know that much basically no they they feel like th that this calling in Christianity today I was reading from this book, Philosidor Maras, Subjective Evolution of Consciousness. This is my recommended reading for the week. <laughs> and he was talking, he was having a conversation with one student, and this student will quote Nicholas of Cusa. He's a Christian mystic from many centuries ago. He will speak on this concept of docta ignorantia in Latin, which means like learned ignorance, which is a very interesting concept. I mentioned that in Radical Personalism. And Srila Samaraj will re-express re that idea as noble ignorance. He will relate it to the Sanskrit term Gyansunya Bhakti, which means a type of devotion where in one sense, uh, he will call it brain-dead bhakti sometimes. <laughs> Which, where, where he's not promoting stop thinking, but just uh, at one point you have so much love and you care so much for loving that it seems that on the plane of knowing things, you don't know that much. You don't care that much. Well, actually, you know a lot because you are loving as much as you can. You ultimately, love is the king of knowledge. So that's it. In connection to the particular question you made in relation to the expression, the lotus feet of Krishna. On the expression lotus feet, or, or there are many other lotus-like uh, expressions in our tradition. Actually, if we pay close attention, every every limb uh, of Krishna's body is depicted in lotus-like terms. We will listen here, like Padma Mukha, his lotus face, Padma Nava, his lotus navel, and so on. His lotus feet, his lotus hands, his lotus wrist, his lotus ankles, his lotus eyes, of course. And so, and there are names. Now, Krishna has so many names, as we know, and many of those names are all included in these different words that may refer to, that may point to the lotus flower. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, why, why lotus, and then why the feet? Now, why, why the lotus? Why so much emphasis on the feet? 
Mm -hmm. And then we have the markings on the feed. So we have like 108 questions inside the questions. It was very tricky from your part, Kevin. <laughs> so I will say something. Of course, we can say so many, so many things, but there are more and more hands being raised. Uh, so first of all, the lotus is, of course, something that indicates many things. And one says it indicates uh, beauty. So that's an, a way of indicating how all of the limbs of Krishna are absolutely beautiful. Uh, like the Bhagavatam says, Bhushana Bhushanangam. No, he, it says, actually, Krishna's limbs are, are decorated with ornaments, but the limbs in, its, in themselves are so beautiful that those limbs are the ornaments of the ornaments. It's not that the ornaments are beautifying Krishna's limbs, but Krishna's limbs are beautifying the ornaments. <laughs> so beauty. No? Krishna is the all-attractive. So his limbs are all attractive. And the lotus is an, a very attractive flower for those who have seen a lotus. It's a very interesting flower. I mean, every flower is beautiful in its own way, but lotus flower is especially beautiful. So that's that's a very uh, accurate analogy in that connection. Also, the lotus flower, the lotus petals indicate softness. And so Krishna's limbs are also described as being extremely tender and soft all of which speaks about his heart. Now, you ultimately don't forget that Krishna's body is not different from Krishna. Krishna is his body. <laughs> now, sometimes we may hear, we are not this body. Okay, Krishna is his body. So there's no difference between Krishna and his body. So when we speak about Krishna's feet are soft, means Krishna is soft. Krishna's feet are beautiful, means he's beautiful. There's no difference. So again, the lotus is tender. So Krishna's heart is tender. Mm -hmm. And we hear also many descriptions in, in, in our tradition how the Brajabhasis are so concerned for Krishna's tenderness. For example, they feel oh, the, the foot soles of his lotus feet are so tender that the gopis pray, uh, that they, they suffer in separation thinking that he may step barefoot as he does in Vrindavan in the forests, walking with the cows. He may step on a pebble and 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 they, he may experience some difficulty because there is so much tenderness about him, not only about his foot sold. So they they enter into this very complex situation in separation. What we can do to relieve him of that? But of course, it is say that all the cows in Brindavan turn all the pebbles at potential obstacles, so to say, to Krishna's walking, turn that turn them to dust with their own walking. So all the land in Brindavan is like like soft, uh, what do you say? What do you find in the beach? Sand, soft sand. So Krishna's tenderness is all, remains in place. So the lotus also implies this, no? beauty, tenderness, fragrance. Again, I won't enter into the details, but so many descriptions in, this, in the scriptures uh, about Krishna's fragrance, no? on the fragrance of his body and how that's absolutely enchanting to the whole forest of Vrindavan. So every limb is compared to a lotus, indicating there is this unique fragrance that drives everyone crazy there. So there is fragrance, again, there is beauty, there is tender. So all of these qualities also uh, relate to the different senses, right? You can see beauty, you can touch tenderness, you can smell fragrance, and so on. Mm -hmm. So so it, it indicates also how this lotus-like analogy in, to Krishna implies all about Krishna is absolutely capturing to all of our senses. And that's why he's called Hrishikesh, or the master of the senses. He has the potential of to absolutely kidnap, so to say, each one of our faculties, each one of our senses. And, and that's bhakti. Bhakti, as Rupa Goswami will say, anyabilasita sunyam jnana karmadi nabritam anukulena krishna anushila nam bhakti rotama. One of the aspects of this definition of bhakti is engaging of all our senses for the pleasure of the master of the senses. So bhakti means all our senses, all our faculties can be offered for Krishna's pleasure. Because he is such a person, such tenderness, such beauty, such fragrance, such everything, that our senses find the perfection, their perfection. He's the, the perfect object of love, which means Krishna is the perfect object of each one of our senses. So some words in connection to 
to the lotus. And also the lotus, something else that comes to mind, the lotus is, is famously, famously depicted in the scriptures as being born, born from mud, from the mud, and raising above it, above it, but remaining in touch with it. Right? So somehow this speaks about Krishna in the sense of his transcendental, if you want to put it like that, ordinariness. <laughs> now, Krishna and his lila seems ordinary, seems limited, seems mundane, but at the same time is way beyond all mundanality. And that's one way of putting it. That's another way of taking these analogies. Krishna is totally transcendental, but he comes to planet Earth over and over again to execute his lila. So in one sense, he's rooted here on Earth. There's not a moment, as I mentioned in radical personalism, where Krishna's lila is not being performed somewhere in the material universe. So he remains in connection to the mud, if you want to put it that, to the Earth. <laughs> but he's ra rising above it. On that platform, he presents his lila, which is absolutely transcendental. So that's another way of connecting the lotus symbol or archetype with what what Krishna is about. So that's again a more general answer and going specifically to the to the lotus feet now. <laughs> Why the lotus feet? Which sometimes, yeah, we may find more emphasis on the feet than on the on the other lotus-like aspects of Krishna's body, personality, heart, lotus heart. In fact, our heart sometimes is described as a lotus, the lotus of the heart. So I will say that the, the emphasis on the feet is uh, in terms of humility. You know? like, like in order to reach a feet, you have to go down. <laughs> no? You have to start, start there. Like you have to fall on the ground and from that place gradually raise and, and, and address all the other layers. But it all begins... Namantayeva, Brahma will say famously in his prayers in the 14th chapter of the 10th canto, Jnana Prayasamodaposya Namantayeva, going back to this idea of Jnana Sanya Bhakti. He will say, this is in the context of Brahma Bimohan Lila, as we know, Brahma becomes bewildered and all his heads are spinning and he's confused and he realizes, I was a little bit like bold and trying to control Krishna, has some doubts, and now Krishna showed me all the mystery that he is and more, and I don't get it. <laughs> I'm bewildered. And Krishna, Brahma has a great thinking capacity, but that capacity has collapsed at this point. So he pronounces this famous word, verse, first lines being, Jnana prayasamodha pasyana mantaeva. One should, one should reject all this big effort of trying to think through God, <laughs> and instead, namantaeva. Namanta means Namaste, Namaskar, one should bow down to him. And by that bowing down, one will receive way more knowledge by the trying to lift up our head and trying to think from a position of, uh, yeah, false pride, so to say. So I will, I will concentrate my answer about the lotus feet in that direction. Like why feet? Why so much service to the feet? Going to the feet, surrendering to the feet, loving the feet? Because that's the beginning beginning place basically no? for for a surrendered servant you yeah you fall at the feet of your master so to say you fall to the ground and, and if you fall to the ground the first thing you will meet are the feet of, of the person in front of you you won't see the head if you are falling like dandavat no this all rec remind, reminds me of the dandavat parikram experience we did last year in govardhan as you may know we circumambulated this sacred hill by doing not by walking but by falling to the ground like a rod one after another one after another we counted it was like ten thousand times we did that totally approx and, and you see the world from another perspective there no you see the world from from that side no like you have to fall and, and like Mahaprabhu will say Trinada peace in each no you have to be lower than the straw in the street <laughs> what does it mean or you have to be you have to be more humble than, well, one way will be literally to fall to the ground, and sometimes the, the straw will grow a little bit high on this this size, let's say, my hand size. So if you fall to the ground like it's rot, you will be lower than the straw in the street, technically. <laughs> so you can learn to see reality from that place and gain a new perspective in which you are 
you are not on top of the hierarchy, so to say. You are not on top of the chain, <laughs> but you are falling and recognizing your position in connection to, to the infinite, to the absolute. So, so that will be basically, I will, I will say the main, the main way to understand that in a practical sense, because many of these things are very allegorical. In, there's an, a level of alleg, alleg, allegory on that, so we can derive purpose and meaning from these descriptions or these expressions in a practical way. Or like you were mentioning, and I won't go there in detail, but just briefly touch upon that, you were then mentioning the markings of the lotus feet. Now we have the markings on the feet of Krishna and Radha, Mahaprabhu, Nityananda, Dwait, and so on. And many of these markings are repeated. No, You have like the umbrella or the elephant or the lotus and so on. And, and, and when they I remember some years ago we did some lectures on explaining each marks. And these these have highly allegorical content, so to say. You no, know? like what's an umbrella? Why an umbrella? You no, know? an umbrella refers to shelter. You no, know? like by you going to those feet, you receive shelter from the rain of let's say suffering and doubts and so on. And, and in this way, each one of these. No, like a fish. Well, why a fish? No, well, a fish, like a fish, can live outside of water. A surrender person to those feet can live outside of the connection with that particular shelter. So each one of these markings have a again highly uh, allegorical meaning. No? So it's important that we understand those so we can really derive some purpose and meaning from them and take advantage in practice, and they do not remain just like as you say like abstract symbols or expressions or conceptions. So I, I appreciate your question because there's so much of that in our tradition. <laughs> so it's important that we learn to like decode each one of those because if not, we may end up just like following or repeating those expressions or conceiving those symbols without understanding the meaning and purpose. So it's just like mechanical blind following, Niyama Graha. And that doesn't make any difference. So and, and so it's important that every time we are confronted, so to say, with one of these or expressions or symbols that do not make sense to us, it, it also in, even on a cultural level, because there are some of the things that are cultural also, that it's a way of conveying certain truths. It's a way of expressing some idea. And typically from India or typically from... Now, when they want to refer to this, they will talk about the umbrella. But for us here in the West, an umbrella is something else. <laughs> so, so we may need even not only an explanation of what that what the umbrella is for them, but also which symbol could be more appropriate to my cultural sensitivities on this side of the world in this time of creation. And maybe we, we may need to speak in terms of something else instead of an umbrella, so to say. And it's okay. The, the, the point here is not about the umbrella. <laughs> the point is this, that we get the importance of taking shelter, for example. So so we need to also give us permission and take the liberty to adjust some of the things whenever that's required for us to continue uh, drawing the proper meaning and purpose to each of these expressions. So just to mention that in, in, beyond your question in a broader sense, so we... We remain open to that, and we really are incorporating the actual intention of those of those expressions. So, thank you, thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Sorry, I, I extended myself a little bit more, a little bit more than usual. We have a few other questions, but again, thank you, Kim. So, let's go with Martina. Martina, nice to see you. Yeah, it's nice to see you as well. Um, my question is related basically on your um, last session from last week when you spoke with Sumati, I think, about Jiva and how we are here, why we are here. I mean, you know, that that's my favorite topic. So mm -hmm. after that, <laughs> you remember. So after that, I was thinking a lot about it. I kind of, um, I mean, even after our conversation, I kind of, I'd say acknowledge, accepted, and it makes sense that we are here from time of no beginning, and uh, karma is also from time of no beginning. But then, you know, last weekend, especially, I started to think more and more because some things are still not clear to me. 
So I really had a long thought process and I wrote it down. And I think maybe it's best that I read it because otherwise I could go really, uh, you know, extend this. Um, and I would like you to also, you know, tell me if I understood something wrong. So, so we are here right under influence of Maya, which is Krishna's external potency. And how I understand it is that then Krishna, it means that Krishna has control over it, which means that he can decide to do whatever he wants with this, like even to take us out from this material world and send us wherever he wants. Let's say it like that. Um, and, you know, um, then we are saying that, but Krishna doesn't want to interfere, right, with our free will because he wants us to come to him if we want to come to him. But then my question is always like, how do we actually have a free will when we are by nature, if I understand well, kind of bound to Krishna? I mean, we are drawn to him. Like maybe we are aware of it or not, but we actually are attracted to him on some level. I think it's in our nature. And then for me, it's like how to understand this as a free will. Um, and if I then, you know, look things from this perspective, for me, it looks like a little bit cruel. Like, why does Krishna, like, why is he leaving us here? I mean, I understand that as we were talking before, it's everything like our perspective. And if we are aware of Krishna, then we can be aware of Krishna here or uh, in spiritual world is the same. But at the same time, we know that this life can be super difficult. And then from that perspective, I'm thinking like, it's a little bit cruel. And why would he do that? Krishna is not cruel, right? So that got me thinking more and more like, um about our free will and about choice um and not in a sense like i started to think that maybe we have more actually power and more free will than we think not in a sense that we are now powerful beings or whatever and not in a sense that you know it's not we are choosing maya over krishna or krishna over maya but I was thinking that it might be something else because, you know, many people are talking about our higher self. And also, like maybe 15 years ago, I was reading books from Michael Newton. I don't know if you ever heard about him. He's a psychiatrist who was uh, putting people um, in regression, like uh, bringing them to past lives and then as well bringing them to a state Mm, where they would actually be in, um, I don't know how to say it, but like somewhere between lives. like And then all people who were going under this regression, they were explaining what souls are doing between two lives. So basically they would all go to some kind of council. They would, um, you know, discuss with maybe God or I don't know with whom, but like with elderly people. They would discuss about this life and then about next life. And why I remember that book was also because recently I had an injury and the way I reacted after that injury was not so good. I mean, I was really like angry and then I was asking so many people for advice, etc., etc. And then after that, I thought like thought crossed my mind that, you know, uh it should it will be good that this type of injury happens again to me because i need to i need to react differently Th this was not a good reaction that i made and mm. this didn't come to me like from the from the perspective of you know i want bad things to come to my life but from the understanding that you know i will need to go through this again in order to to react differently so then, I, you know, with all of that, I'm trying to wrap up now. I started to think, is there actually, are we here because we want to be here? Because we want to go through some experiences and we want to learn something rather than being here because, I don't know, we are choosing Maya over Krishna or, um, you know what I mean? So is there actually free choice in that 
could we say that that would be a free choice to to actually choosing together with Krishna, of course, on certain level to be here rather than seeing that from from other perspectives as I was seeing it till now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I hope I covered everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So one sense, your last question is wrapping up all you said, and the question was like, could we see if we are here because of our own choice? And I can say yes, and that's the end of my answer, but <laughs> I think I may have to say something else. And of course, it's, there are many things that you mentioned and many questions and topics and themes inside the question. Uh, regarding free will, of course, it's an ongoing conversation like any other topic. We have free will because... Of course, again, the, the expression free will can be tricky because then immediately the question is how free is our will? Because free will gives the idea of I can do whatever I want uh, and it will happen. And that's not the case, clearly. No, the, I don't, I'm not saying you try, it, but just you see a bird flying and you want to imitate him, you will need to wait for your next lifetime. <laughs> So if you try to imitate him, you will be very soon imitating him in your next lifetime because you will you will be dead just jumping out of the window trying to fly. So clearly, and that's of course a physical example, but in so many other ways, uh, because sometimes people say well, whatever you wish, it can it will happen, and mm, yes and no. I mean, of course, if you wish something very intensely, it may happen eventually, but also there are so many things coming in, in your way because of previous things you desire that may make your wish come true in a few lifetimes even. No? So it's not just like, okay, I will concentrate, I want to be a millionaire by the end of the year and it has to happen by the strength of my will. The point is that my will is not the only thing that exists. No, it's not the only thing in existence that whatever I will, it has to happen. There are so many other factors in between. And again, our previous choices, the result of those choices, Krishna's own will, again, Krishna is a person, he has his own free will, he has free will, technically speaking, in every sense of the term, mm, but also he he honors our will, as we always mention. If there will be no honoring of the will, uh, basically, we are deprived of our will. If we have no choice in, in the matter whatsoever regarding loving Krishna, like I mentioned in my first book, if we will say that we already have an inherent relationship with Krishna, which is already predetermined in every sense of the term, how much we are choosing how to love Krishna. Not only we should choose to love or not love Krishna, but how to love Krishna. If, if loving God, establishing a relationship with God is the most important thing, I will assume that we will be offered the chance to choose how to love him. Because again, love is a voluntary decision. And not only voluntary in terms of I choose to love you or not, but how do I choose to love you? So again, free will is necessary for loving, for attaining the goal of life, which is love. If we are deprived of free will, we are deprived of love. We are deprived of the goal of life. So that on one side. Uh, but again, we have some will. And as you mentioned, I appreciate the point you made. In one sense, we could say, although our will is not uh, freest in the uh, absolute sense of the term, it's also not as insignificant as we may be thinking. Because one may say, because of that exactly, one can explain why there is anadi karma. We are conditioned from time without beginning, which shows how much will we can have to choose life after life after life after life of going in a certain direction. <laughs> That's our will being invested in some direction for zillions of lifetimes and we are still here so to say so that also is a way of proving we have our will <laughs> it's not that someone else is forcing us in that situation we are choosing that over and over again repeatedly and our will is creating that particular result and circumstance which of course this boils down to personal responsibility over i wouldn't say nothing of this is about chastisement or cruelty but it's just the loss, the cosmic loss, let's say like that, of nature, of the universe, of reality are, are such. First of all, that Krishna cannot transgress them. Now, he himself says in, this, in the scriptures, 
No, these laws are being established, dharma, if you want to call it like that, which is a, a term to encompass how things operate in reality. And Krishna, although he's God and can do whatever he likes, at the same time he says, I cannot do any, anything and everything. There are certain things that I, I honor, I respect, certain laws, certain codes that keep the whole show running, so to say, keep the whole universe sustainable. So, so he doesn't transgress those things. So these laws are there for us to teach us responsibility, which ultimately converges in love. Love is the ultimate responsibility, where you really take responsibility for everything and everyone and you and your beloved and everything around you. But we have to begin somewhere with some slight sense of responsibility, which has to do with this idea of we do something that has some consequence. We have to take responsibility for that. It's not chastisement. It's not punishment. It's not cruelty. It's just love in the form of teaching, inviting us to become responsible. But also we can choose not to become responsible <laughs> and just remain irresponsible, re remain an eternal teenager. But Krishna is the only eternal teenager and it works for him. <laughs> no, he's Navajovanam. No, Nava Kishore, eternally adolescent. And he does it perfectly. But the problem is we want to imitate Krishna, as, you, as sometimes you hear. We want to be God. One way of putting that is we want to be God because we want to be remain eternally adolescent. <laughs> so, so we have to take responsibility, grow and become adults, basically. And that may take some time. That may take lots of many lifetimes. Uh, so, but but I wouldn't say this is cruel. Again, this is Krishna's allowing our will to be expressed in whatever direction that's choosing to be expressed at every moment. Even if we at present are in this particular moment being influenced by whatever different elements, we can be speaking about even mixed influences, influenced by bhakti, shakti, influenced by the gunas, depending our level of surrender, there will be different types of influences in the environment. That doesn't mean that we that we have been devoid of free will. It's not that free will happens when there is no influence, because that doesn't exist. No? A soul without any influence from Maya Shakti or Swarup Shakti exists in one sense, but that will be the experience of Brahman. <laughs> where there is no Sarup Shakti operating, there is no Maya Shakti operating, but there's no sense of self either. And therefore there's no experience, which is not what we are after. So my point is we are will for us eternally, we will be under the influence of one energy or another, Maya Shakti, Swarup Shakti, combination of both in certain stages. But in that context, our will is there. Our will is always there present so so i will say yeah it's about each us each of us choosing at every step of course many times we are not aware of our choices and we just like mechanically just follow the motions or or, or are like carried away by by the result of our previous choices so to say <laughs> no, because sometimes you choose something and that creates a ripple effect so to say a set of consequences that come eventually and haunt you, so to say. We are like shoo, kind of forced in that direction. Krishna sometimes, Arjuna asked that about, about that in the Gita. Now, why some people act in certain way, like if forced to do so. But that's related to previous choices we made. So th there's always the fact of us taking a choice and receiving the result of that and somehow having to become responsible for that. Like, for example, if I take a in the past, I, whatever, I act in a certain way, and that create, creates a certain momentum and pattern of, of thought that comes as a fruit of that, and I'm being carried by that, of some emotion that I feel I cannot control, and, and I could say, I didn't have will at that moment, I was deprived of will, I was just carried by that emotion, but again, that emotion was the result of previous choices. And that was the outcome of that choice that came. I was carried as if I wouldn't have a will at that moment. The will is still there, but <laughs> somehow or other, I, I, I was captured by the experience and, 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 and my agency, my capacity to decide was not, not off. It's not disappearing, but it's not op operative at that moment. 
but eventually I have to reflect on that and realize, okay, with my will, I acted in a certain way. I decided to think, feel, whatever. And this came as a result. So therefore, if I want something different, I have to choose in a different direction. And then comes your will again, taking place and taking certain decisions. As, as we say, we, we take a certain decision and that certain decision, when you repeat it sequentially in time, that creates a certain habit. We create impressions and, and, and those impressions eventually become habits and those habits put together, maintain, creates a, a, a new destiny, if you want to speak in those terms. So I wouldn't say this has something to do with Krishna being cruel or something. Again, he loves us. And because he loves us, he's allowing us to choose. And again, I, I, sorry if I seem to be hammering on this point many times in the past, but one of the ways that Krishna shows that, that he actually loves us and that he's not cruel is that he's allowing us to, to grow in our experience of, of love and responsibility. And he's with us at every moment. That's the thing. It's not that we are here left by Krishna and, and Krishna is somewhere else, as I, we mentioned many times. He's closer than anything. He's the closer than the closest. The fact that we don't realize that, that's another conversation. But he's as close as he can. We we may not feel that, but that's because of our choices that makes us in the past that makes us distracted from that fact and, and absorbed in another dimension of reality. But he remains as close as he can, always. <laughs> so now we are in the process of realizing that. And the, and, and the more the deeper we go in our practice, the more we will realize, ah, oh, you are there all the time. You are there all the time, closer than everything else that I thought, closer than myself. I mean, you are more intimately connected and more well-wishing to me than my own self, than anyone else. But I completely became uh, like, yeah, unaware of that reality. So the more we advance in, in bhakti, the more we start to get a glimpse of that reality and the more we became so moved by that, that naturally it propels our further engagement in bhakti because we realize, wow, you have been there all the time, loving me unconditionally, accepting me absolutely and completely. And I have been living for zillions of lifetimes, completely unaware of that, thinking, treating myself badly, treating others badly, treating you badly, thinking you didn't exist. I was so, this. I had such a capacity of potential for destruction <laughs> that I missed all those facts the most fundamental, obvious, close facts, I am completely unaware of that. And I live completely lost for zillions of lifetimes. You hear so many prayers of, of the awakened ones in that connection, no? because that's a natural feeling. When you awaken, you realize, oh my gosh, no? <laughs> all of this was there all the time. And I live as if this didn't exist forever. And, and now I'm awakening to the fact it was closer than anything. Oh, that, that's like the natural contrasting experience when you wake up. Again, like if you were living in a cave for, for eternity and suddenly you discover the sun and you're like, oh my gosh, no, I can see so many things. This sun is showing me such a possibility, such a galaxy of possibilities that I never was aware of because I just was taking the darkness of the cave as the unique reality. So it's like, wow. But again, in order to really fully understand what we are talking about here, we need to get out of the cave, basically, which is this classic analogy. We get to, to, to get enlightened. We can talk about it, and we are trying our best. I'm trying my best to reply. You're trying your best to, to present your question, and, and we can talk and think. But it's still some things may not make full sense because they will only make full sense when we when we get out of the cave. <laughs> no, we, they will never make full sense here. They will make some sense here, hopefully. Something, hopefully something I'm saying makes some sense. <laughs> but even if we feel still there's something missing, yeah, the missing thing is you are being they are missing you outside of the cave. No, we need to get out of the cave. And uh, they are missing us. Krishna's missing us outside of the cave. He's waiting there. <laughs> That's the miss, the missing link. <laughs> We are the missing link, so so we need to 
to awaken basically to get enlightened what we are trying gradually and 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 whatever didn't make full sense will be perfectly revealed like immediately it will be like this type of epiphany or, or even we will be getting some trailers of that as the scripture describes no no you don't need even to reach the ultimate goal but you will be given some trailers in between this flash no flash epiphany is like wow everything is perfect everything is in place everything is interconnected krishna loves me unconditionally again we may have those glimpses and then of course comes the the, the daily effort to retain those glimpses, to retain and reclaim those glimpses instead of going into autopilot again and starting to see relativity, separation, conflict, cruelness, or who knows, so many things we, we see through our own filters. So we have to practice and pray for for a moment of clarity. <laughs> and, and, and like Sukadev Goswami will tell Parikshit, just one moment of clarity is enough. Is even even if, if still you haven't attained the full goal, that moment of clarity will show you so much that even if you then return to your quote unquote normal <laughs> vision, that moment of clarity was so self illuminating, self effulgent, and show you reality in such a degree that there is no journey back from that. <laughs> that will accompany you forever as, as a constant reminder of what reality looks like actually and then you cannot but engage in practice and life striving for for living that vision for inhabiting that vision again forever no so that's what i can say today martina i hope that makes some sense <laughs> and the remaining there are still some questions as you said but uh, yeah, yeah i need to go out from the cave <laughs> I, and I, I think it's good because questions are coming and then I'm trying that's to understand good. and there will be more and more and more and that's, um, it's that's how we pro That's how we progress, of course. I, I'm never expecting giving an answer and, okay, no more questions, right? About this, let's close the topic. No, no, new questions, but also hopefully new answers also and we have to process those answers, do something with those answers, not merely in our head or intellectually, but take them to prayer, take them to practice, take them to life and, and receive some mercy, some grace, some answers, some realization. And, and probably when that happens, some of the questions that we have solved by themselves, at least some of them, that happens a lot. Or become irrelevant, so many things can happen. Or if they still remain, of course, the conversation continues. <laughs> it's an ongoing dialogue. So thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, please. And pranam to Jagannath Baladev Subhadraji over there. <laughs> so let's go with the next raise hand. And sorry, the four remaining ones, we will address all of you, but to, to make keep you waiting there. So next hand raise is from Achyuta Prabhu. So you can unmute yourself, please. Hi, Bo Maharaj. Um, thanks for the class. Um, my first time here, actually, I've been watching you live on Facebook and I've um, been pretty inspired, so I thought I'd come to the Zoom meeting and get some more, more Welcome. association. Welcome. Um, my question was about uh, pride and spiritual advancement. Pride? You say pride? Pride, yeah, yeah. and spiritual advancement. Because in, in from what I understand, the, the process that we follow is, is so powerful um, simply by chanting and associating with devotees and reading, we can experience tangible, um, we can feel like we're making progress. We become more attracted to Krishna or he might give us some mercy and show us things. And we can get very inspired by that. But um, alongside that can also come uh, a lot of pride. Um, if we're experiencing you know, something from chanting or from reading, we can think that we're, uh, elevated above people who are not experiencing that so how do we how do we balance that in a spiritual life because i understand pride is quite a big uh, a big hurdle and an advancement something that krishna really really is not fond of so could you uh speak about that a little bit please yeah thank, thank you. you thank you for your question and of course always a relevant topic to to talk about this potential shortcomings or pitfalls in our path and, and remaining and aware that 
this can take so many forms also, no? because we can say pride. And I, I will say many of us think of pride as in some way, according to our stage and the, and the place we are now and what price looks like for us now. <laughs> but eventually, as, as the journey progresses, pride will take different dresses, so to say. So that is also another layer of, of answer, no? because be careful to not to watch out for not like over idealizing how pride will look like in every part of your life, because it will take different forms and we have to be able to detect them. Not only pride, everything, <laughs> not only potential pitfalls, but also positive things like humility, surrender. We have our idea of what's that, but that will evolve in time. So we should allow those things to evolve as we evolve. Because if not, we cannot evolve. <laughs> if we do not allow those things to evolve, we are not evolving. Because we will be only evolve along with them. No, <laughs> I will only evolve along with an evolving notion of humility, with an evolving notion of surrender, and with that evol evolving notion of pride, and so on. Because if I don't have that evolvingness <laughs> in, in my mind, that will create yeah considerable problems. So. <clears throat> So regarding your question on pride and spiritual advancement, of course, one somehow is the opposite of the other. Pride gets in the way of spiritual advancement and spiritual advancement has nothing to do with pride. But as you mentioned, one can come from the other. This is what Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur will call Bhakti Yuta Anartha. No, I, I won't get too much into the technical definition, but he speaks in his Madhurya Kadambini, where he's describing the different stages of bhakti when he speaks about anartha nivriti. Uh, he describes four types of anarthas, sukritota, duskritota, aparadota, and bhaktiota anartha. So bhaktiota anartha means like anarthas which come from bhakti, which of course, bhakti is not bringing anarthas, <laughs> but as you mentioned, we can practice bhakti, we can advance, and as a result of that advancement, we can become proud of that. In that sense, it's an anartha that comes from bhakti. Not from bhakti herself, but from our uh, mistaken assessment of where does advancement come from, so to say. <laughs> and we end up concluding, it's my merit, it's my trophy, no, I did it, I advanced, I'm higher, instead of actually being humbled by that advancement, which is what should be happening. The more we advance, the more humble we should become because we will realize this advancement, okay, I'm making my effort, but grace is the main element here. And bhakti is a gift, as I tried to make the point <clears throat> in my first book. Bhakti is not a, a right, no? I have, right, bhakti. No, but it's a gift that I receive. So if bhakti is a gift, how can I ever become proud of a gift? No. Because it has been given to me. No. So I, how can I become proud of having received the gift? It makes no sense, right? If someone now, let's go to another type of gifts in this world. I so, know oh you are absolutely poor, homeless person, uh, dying of hunger and coal on the street, and someone comes to you and gives you a million dollars. You won't become proud of that. You won't become like, now I'm a millionaire. No. You will just feel so humbled and feel, I owe my life to this person who gave me this million dollars. And the next question is, uh, how do I spend the rest of my life serving this person back, trying to reciprocate? <laughs> the last thing that comes to your mind is, I'll become proud because I'm such a great person. You, you are totally aware. I've been rescued. I've been saved. I've been gifted. That's very clear. Of course, in time, you can go crazy and think, I'm a millionaire. <laughs> that can happen. <laughs> but if you are sober on some level, you, you will be humbled by the gift. Uh, so that's, and I'm giving a material example of $1 million. Bhakti doesn't even compare to that. Even unfortunately for some of us, we receive one million dollars, we may forget bhakti and think this is the greatest gift, but there's no comparison to bhakti as a gift. That's the greatest gift ever offered and ever received. So 
the nature of bhakti is that the nature of bhakti is that bhakti is a gift and we cannot become proud by definition we cannot become proud of something that is always a gift always a grace always something coming from above it's never first and foremost my merits no, my deserving stuff so i think i'm not saying this is the final solution to this quandary but just saying to know this very clearly it's 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 helping us it's protecting us so much from pride because pride basically means i mean someone who is proud it's not a bad person necessarily it's just someone who became unaware distracted from the fact of that bhakti is a gift from the fact that that I'm a dependent unit on, on, on the whole, you know? like I'm connected with Krishna. It's not like proud journey has to do with Bhayam Dutiyabini Veshatashat, what the Bhagavatam say. Out of ignorance, we develop this dualistic mentality, fragmented consciousness, where I see myself as separate from the source, from my source. And pride eventually comes as a byproduct of that. I see myself as a separate doer, as a separate attainer, as a separate achiever, as a separate something. <laughs> but when I remain aware, I'm not separate, I'm connected to my source, to the center, to Krishna, I'm dependent, I'm being showered by grace, there's no place for pride. So <clears throat> for me, the best way to combat, so to say, <clears throat> pride, it's not so much like I have to fight against pride, proud, get out of me, you are bad, whatever. But it's taking the positive cautionary stance so to say of and and and, and you were mentioning achita that uh, okay bhakti practices are very powerful like chanting and being in association with the devotees <clears throat> but sometimes by doing that we advance and become proud but actually if you're chanting in the right association that can never happen because the right association will protect you from pride will educate you in such a way that you will realize I have no actual reason to become proud because the nature of bhakti is a gift and so on and so forth. All the things we learn in right association. That means to be in right association. <laughs> you follow my point. Uh, because if, 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 if I'm in right association, if I'm totally proud, I'm not saying if you are proud, you are not in right association. You may be in right association, but you may not be listening. <laughs> And if you are not listening to right association, you are not in right association. No. The right association may be there. We are not there because we are not listening. We are not taking what comes from that satsanga. But if we are in actual satsanga, sadhu sangha, actual sadhu sangha, we will receive this type of not only teachings, but personal examples of humble practitioners who the more they advance, the more humble they become. That's the nature of bhakti. Sanatana Goswami will will equate bhakti with humility. He will say, the two of them act as cause and effect of each other. The more humble you are, the more you advance in bhakti. The more you advance in bhakti, the more humble you become. He's not saying the more you advance in bhakti, the more proud you become. That shouldn't, that cannot happen. If that's happening, we are not advancing in bhakti. <clears throat> so I will even make that point. We could say, <laughs> If I become proud of my advancement in bhakti, that was not advancement. Because real advancement in bhakti makes you humble. <laughs> Follow my point? If one is really advancing in bhakti, the nature of that advancement is humbling. It, it makes you more aware of the nature of the gift. But if I'm becoming more and more proud, maybe I'm just having an an illusory sense of advancement, so to say. Because there, that also happens. You can have an illusory sense of advancement because, I don't know, I have more followers or I have more position or I have more recognition. I'm more advanced, but that doesn't mean you are more advanced. No. The symptoms of advancement are not measurable in, in external numbers, so to say. So, so the, the real measurement, again, for advancement is humility. <laughs> That's why Mahaprabhu emphasized humility so much. In the very first line of his most important instruction, again, to another piece in its in, be humble. Be humble is another way of saying advance in bhakti. <laughs> no. Because that's the nature of advancement in bhakti. You will become humble. So 
So I would say that if we, and, and that's instruction for chanting. You were mentioning chanting and association. Chanting has to be done in the spirit of this verse of Sikshastakan, which first and foremost promotes humility. So chanting has to be done from a platform of humility. Sadhu Sangha, real Sadhu Sangha is in the context of humility and the realization of the gift we are receiving. So if we remain in that association with that input, chanting in that mode, again, we will be utterly protected from pride. There is no place from pride there. Because there is such a higher uh, samskar or impressions being invoked. So pride is there's no way for pride there. And again, if, if pride comes in whatever way, in some cases, then we need to to remind ourselves of these basic facts. You know? Like if I choose to to embrace reality from a sober perspective, <laughs> there cannot be pride. No? Pride in, in the indicates intoxication, basically. That's why I tell the devotees when they are too much, uh, <laughs> too much structured in terms of what does it mean to follow the four regulative principles. One of them is no intoxication. Well, as long as you have pride, you are you are indulging in that one. You are you are intoxicated. So we are breaking the four regulative principles easier than what we may think. <laughs> so humility is the sovereign factor here. No? So if we are in good association with good guidance, with good example, we'll be, and, and our practice on a daily basis is, consists of feeding on those inputs, we'll have enough daily reminders for us to be protected from pride. We'll have enough daily reminders of bhakti is a gift, is so generous, the nature of this dispensation is absolutely undeserved. Krishna loves me unconditionally. So how can I become proud of that? Again, that will be another thing. Krishna loves you unconditionally. There's nothing to become proud of that. <laughs> That's his gift. I can just humbly acknowledge that and receive that and, and, and confess I need it. But I cannot just say, ah, Krishna loves me unconditionally. But it's, you did nothing to deserve that. That's why it's unconditional. So we will come humble. He loves everyone else unconditionally, by the way. It's not only you. So we become humble. <laughs> so anyhow, there's some thoughts that can, in, in connection to your question today, in that in this particular direction, as usual, any any of these questions can be answered from a myriad of perspectives, but that's where the call came today in this particular direction. So I hope that helps in some in some way. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Padling Maharaj. It was a nice answer. Okay. Thank you for your question. So still we have three more questions, so let's go to them. I'm sorry if I may not extend myself in detail as I would like to with each of them, but we'll try to address the three remaining ones. So next question, the one raising his hand is Rajendra. So please, Rajendra, you can unmute yourself. And you must be in India, so it must be quite late. So, yeah. yeah I'm in Nepal, Maras. I want to keep you up <laughs> that late there. <laughs> Thank you, Maras. Please accept my pronoun. Uh, I have been listening your lectures and videos recently and I have come across uh, one point in few of your lectures regarding personal experience in bhakti. Okay. How uh, <clears throat> how personal experience is the highest praman and mm -hmm. the tendency we have is sometimes lack of those personal experiences can be, you know, filled by theological concepts in bhakti and philosophical, I mean, philosophical concepts. So how are we supposed to cultivate those deep experiences in bhakti and, you know, avoid falling into trap of conceptual understanding? <clears throat> Okay, thank you. So your question revolves around the <clears throat> the notion of <clears throat> the notion of personal experience, which is termed in Sanskrit as pratyaksha. We have talked about that also in radical personalism to some length, uh, because sometimes pratyaksha or personal experience, unfortunately, has been historically dismissed in ours or other traditions. You know, like 
your your experience doesn't matter. You are a conditioned soul, so whatever you feel or think is always limited. So don't pay attention to that. There's no value. No? I mean, I'm being a little bit like ex extreme and sarcastic in how I'm expressing it, but sometimes that's how it sounded to some or even worse. So I'm, I don't feel I'm in exaggerated in some cases. So so basically that, that makes for a, a very cultish pattern, basically, where you are deprived of your own will, where you are disempowered of whatever you can experience. And instead you become just like dependent on, on what others tell you. No, this is the experience. This is how you should think. This is how you should feel. And you become kind of a robot, basically. No? So the scriptures do not validate that. The scriptures validate personal experience. That's one of the main pramanas or ways of experiencing reality. In Krishna, the Bhagavad Gita, in the ninth chapter, most important chapter, and one of the most important verses in that chapter, verse 2, he says, what? Rajabidya Rajaguhyam Pavitra Midamotamam Pratyaksha Avagamam Dharmyam Susukam Kartuma Abhyayam. He's speaking of a bhakti as the king of knowledge and the king of secrets, and so on and so forth. And he says, and bhakti is to be understood by Pratyaksha, by personal experience. There's no other way. In other words, also the point here, and Sanatana Goswami mentions even more this point in, in the commentary of Brihad Bhagavatamrita, which is what I quote in Radical Personalism. He says, he refers to Pratyaksha uh, as Shrestha, uh, as like the highest or main Ramana. Uh, because sometimes we're used to hear Shabda Pramana is the highest, reveal knowledge is the highest. And there is a place for that. Jiva Goswami makes this point in Tattva Sandarva. But Sanatana Goswami says, protection is the highest. So what does he mean by that? Well, he means that ultimately, even, even if I tell you the revealed knowledge from a scripture is the higher source of knowledge, you need to have a personal experience of that for you to embrace that idea. If I, if I read you, reveal a scripture and it's nonsense for you, your personal experience is, this is nonsense, this makes no sense, you won't accept that Shabda, the scripture is the ultimate Brahman. So if we accept, okay, the Srimad Bhagavatam or whatever, depending on the tradition, is the ultimate source of revelation, that should be because I had a personal experience of how that's the case. If you are just accepting that without the personal experience, you are promoting some cultish paradigm there. You are being sectarian, you are, you are a danger to society. <laughs> So to say, no. because again, we can we can quote scripture and, and show allegiance to Shastra in a blind, fanatical, lacking experience and try to impose that on others without me having an experience. So you can imagine which type of experience you will give to others if you do that. <laughs> you will burn them out to ashes. So So experience is so crucial. If I don't have an experience, I don't know, that you are trusting and loving, I cannot trust you. If I have an experience of you in the opposite direction, I cannot I cannot open my heart to you yet, unfortunately. No, so we need first an experience and another experience and another layer of experience and so on and so forth. And in time, this multiplicity of experiences of course create a particular openness and a particular trust and a particular faith because faith means that. Faith, faith means trust based on experience. That's faith. That's how faith has been described by many theologians. The trust or confidence that comes from experience. If there is no experience, it may be a belief. No, I believe in this. I believe that this is so and so. But if you have no experience, that's not faith. That's not tangible, undeniable, per first-hand personal experience. That's just your mental conviction, or who knows what. So, so how to have those experiences? Again, we are we are units of experience to begin with, right? We cannot not experience. <laughs> now that's what makes us alive, real entities. No, you have an experience. You cannot deny that that you have an experience. That, that's the confirmation for the existence of the soul and of consciousness, if you will. We are experiential units. No? We are units of experience. So we cannot not experience. We are always experiencing. The point is, 
we are speaking about here a particular type of experience, no? in connection to bhakti and so on. So how to have those experiences, not to how to have experience, you already have experience, but most of our experiences, we could say, in general before, had been in connection to certain environment, certain shakti, in connection to maya shakti, if you want to put it like that, in connection to a perspective of life alienated from the center. So now we need another type of experience, which will happen in the context of a different environment, which called bhakti. In our tradition, we'll call sadhu sangha. So, so that's how we will have those experiences. When I say having experiences, please do not go to, I need to hear Krishna's flute and I need to have visions. Those things will happen and may happen, but that's not only experience, right? Experience in bhakti doesn't mean I have to hear, see someone descending from the sky. And until and unless that happens, I have not experienced yet of bhakti. And that doesn't mean, I, I hope all of us are having some experience right now, right here in this precise conversation we are having. Something is being moved, something are being confirmed, some things are happening inside of you in, in an inspiring way, in a nourishing way. So if, if that's the case, that's it. There you have your experience. No, we are already having it. And, and we need to just reinforce these experiences repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Not just by a, like, like a matter of accumulation, but just because experiences in themselves are so, uh, how to say, so, so, so beautiful <laughs> that we will choose to do it over and over again for eternity. That's why bhakti is the means and the goal. That's what Krishna says in this verse that I refer to, Susukam Kartum, Abhiyam. Bhakti is to be executed with joy. Bhakti by nature is joyful. So if you contact bhakti, it has to provide an inspiring experience. If that's not the case, I'm not so sure what you are contacting. I'm not so sure where, where you are plugging. So, so to have experiences in bhakti, to have experiences of growth and inspiration, epiphanies, we just must need to keep connected with the proper energetic source, with the proper plug, with the proper sangha, with the proper people. That's what Rupa Goswami will say when he defines sadhu sangha. He will use these three terms, sajatya, svatavara, snigdasya. You have to connect with people who are affectionate, snigda, who are compassionate, who are loving, Swatavara, who have advancement and probably likely people who is more advanced as well. And, and we will feel that. Again, we, we are experiential units. So if you are in front of someone very advanced and you are honest and sincere, you will feel, oh, this, this lady, this man has something I don't have, she has some realization, she has some depth, has some vision that I don't have, but that I feel inspired, I feel drawn towards. So I want to remain in touch with that. So that means Swatavara, more advanced, affectionate, as I say, and Swajatya. Swajatya means like minded. No? Connect with people that we feel, okay, this is my tribe. No? We are talking similar language here. We are the same species. We have a similar way of approaching spirituality, reality. I feel comfortable. I feel identified. I feel challenged. Also, no, it doesn't mean the like minded is they they will just like spoiling you. No? Oh, yeah, 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 I understand. No, you, you will be challenged enough, <laughs> uh, but to the point that again, it's in the context of the other qualities, snigdasya, affectionate. No, so there will be affection, affectionate challenge, put it like that, <laughs> like minded challenge from like minded people who love you, and because they love you, they challenge you. And that challenge doesn't even mean that let's say I will tell you personally something, but just you expose yourself to that environment with the nature of the conversation is such that the, the things that come in the conversation become a challenge, healthy challenge. Like invite you to grow, invite you to go deeper, invite you to, to embrace a higher version of yourself, which is not easy, but not impossible. So... So yeah, to have that experience, I will say it's important to remain in proximity to those who are having the experiences we lack. Let's put it like that. You get closer to people and you realize, you realize, you feel some intuition on some level. 
wow, they are having some, there are, there are some things going on inside of them that I, I'm, I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> I can feel something. I'm not grasping it fully, but it feels, it's attractive. It feels attractive. I want to get closer to that. I want to dive deeper into that. I still don't understand what's going on, but it's attractive. Like I remember once I, I told this hundreds of times, I was once given a lecture and, and after the lecture, I asked to a set to a group of yoga students in Argentina, like more than 10 years ago. And then I asked to the yoga, to the teacher, their teacher, she was there in the class. So what do you think about the lecture? Did they, did they like it, understand? And, and she told me, well, Marsh, I, 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 I know them. I look at their faces and their faces were saying, I don't understand anything, but please don't stop. <laughs> So I like that combination. I like, like I'm receiving something that way above my head, but there is something deep, deeper than that in me that says, "Don't stop." I'm attracted to this. I'm, I'm, I'm called, drawn to this. So that's how we will get deeper experiences. You now, remain in touch with people who are having a, a deeper experience by being close to their, those people. We are not having their experience, but we'll be having an experience of being in the proximity of their experience. In itself, that's an experience. That may be enough experience for the day for us. You follow my point? You get to someone more advanced, you get close to that person, not necessarily physically, <laughs> but close in terms of opening your heart, hearing, relating. You, it's not. It doesn't mean you are having the exact same experience that that person has, that drawing you to that person but you will have an experience of what it means to get closer to the experience of that person. And that gives you an experience. And that makes you even closer to that experience <laughs> and so on and so forth, right? In one way, it's what we are trying to do here among each other. Uh, it's not just all in relation to one person, but each one of us have their own experience and each of us can be nourished by the experience of each other. Even if sometimes none of us, not all of us are talking but just the presence, the attention, what to speak when someone presents a question or shares some thoughts. So we are getting closer to the other person's experience and that creates an experience for us. So, so yeah, I will try to emphasize those points in connection to your question today. Uh, of course, Rajendra, we can say so many other things, but I'd like to conclude there since we have a few questions before concluding. So. I appreciate your question. I hope that helps. Thank you, Maras. Thank you. Thank you. So let's continue with Madhav, who is raising his hand as well. Can I... Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Danvar Pranam. Pranam. Maharaj. Nice. Yeah, Maharaj. Nice to see you. Maharaj, like we were uh, discussing last week about uh, the difference between traditional parivars and uh, the neo Gaudiya Vaishnavism starting from Bhaktivinoda Thakur and even like even further from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasthi Thakur. So we see that there is a big divide created between the traditional Parivars and the modern Gaudiya Vaishnavas. So it, it, it happens quite often that the uh, traditional Parivars, they have a, a very inimical or rather a very bad impression about uh, the Gaudiya Mutt and its gone onwards. So how do we deal with the... Uh, Vice versa. People? Yeah, so that that's true, definitely. But how do we deal with them without getting into that mindset of that they're sahajiyas? Like what happens is we, uh, in trying to deal with them, we mark them as sahajiyas so that we don't have to deal with anything they say. We don't have to accept anything they say. And we just outrightly uh, blanket term them as uh, sahajiyas. Mm -hmm. So what is the correct way to like approach this whole dynamic of hatred and whatever? How do we approach this contention properly? Okay. I will say, thank you for the question. Uh, I will say that a good way to begin is to realize that the nature of this, if you want to call it hatred or conflict, division, criticism, whatever, that's everywhere, right? It's not just from Gaudiya Mat branches toward traditional paribars and vice versa. Because it's also among members of the of the same Gaudiya Mat branches of one same mission of one same temple. It's among members of traditional parivars. I mean, I know lots of cases in in all of these directions. 
and it goes beyond traditional Parivars and Gaudiya Vaishnavas and other religious traditions and everyone in the in the whole creation. <laughs> so I think it's 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 good to normalize, not because it's good and we have to establish that as a standard, but to understand, okay, we are we are not in Golok Brindavan, so it's somehow natural, natural, quote unquote, <laughs> to witness those types of situations in such an unnatural uh, dynamic. So it will happen. I'm not saying that to just let's not do anything and it will happen. So let's, no, no, but just to 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 be, begin with that foundation of acceptance, not like normalizing, yes, these things will happen, are happening due to the conditioned nature of most people. There will be conflict, five, fundamentalism, tribalism, elitism, all these isms, racism, as I like to call it even, not racism, but racism, to be racist in the context of rasa. No? My race is higher than yours, I'm whatever. So this all speaks not about this group or that group or the achari of this group, but it speaks about the conditioning of the individuals, which will come in any group. And if in every single group, you will find these patterns. And in every single group, you will find also mature practitioners who are respectful and appreciative so I like to to explain these situations in this way, because again, they are individuals, and at the end of the day, we want to be personal <laughs> and not just limit the discussion to go the Ahmad branches, so to say, or Iskun, and traditional parivas like like impersonal entities, but there are people inside those, and so and there are different relationships between those people. It's not just in one single way. And again, I have friends in traditional paribars who are mature, respectful, open, loving, and they themselves appreciate that from other lineages. So it, I, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that as well, uh, to acknowledge the personal interaction. And probably that's a way to begin the com conversations and, com and to begin healing differences from the past instead of just expecting like a massive, so to say, institutional change of opinion from traditional parts toward followers of Bhaktisiddhanta and vice versa. That may never happen if we expect that to happen in that way. But it, it's already happening if we think in terms of personal interactions between members of those groups. So in that sense, it's already happening. And I, and, and of course, someone say, yeah, it's already happening, but in, in, in the majority, it's not happening. Okay, I, I understand, but we have to begin somewhere. <laughs> and 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 that somewhere also bring it boils down to my personal responsibility in that equation. So 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 what I I am to do? What can I offer in this particular dynamics and need and conversation? Is there something I can do instead of expecting the whole thing to change massively? You know, that's a little that can be like evasive and comfortable, like from my part. You no, know, like okay, let me know when er everyone is hanging on nicely and, and I will jump into the conversation. No, no, it's what can I do myself today to help in this? And as you mentioned, one thing may be not to rush and stigmatize whomever is outside of my tribe as whatever, sahaja, deviant, offenders, uh, <laughs> because that's impersonalism. Again, you are labeling a whole tradition, a whole lineage, a whole group, as something, because of the behavior of a few or, or or of many even, without acknowledging there are others who are not like that, and also without acknowledging that we may be possessing in some degree those qualities we are throwing on the others. How much I'm not a sahaja? I mean, sahaja means many things. How much I'm not impersonal? How much I'm not an offender? How much I'm not deviant? I mean, how much I'm free from all that stuff? Of course, it's easier to create an enemy outside and create union, quote unquote, among our tribe by establishing a common enemy. Let's be united against him. But that's that's superficial union. We have to be united on a positive, with a positive cause, not just because that guy is so, so ugly. So we unite against that. No, not, our union shouldn't be only against things, <laughs> but in favor of. So... So I think, yeah, we should be mature, responsible enough to ask ourselves, what can I 
contribute to the conversation with my own example. Uh, and, and, and as much as in some situations there are stances or opinions or people acting in a certain way that there is no chance for that conversation, uh, well, we, we may need to take some distance also. No? We, we shouldn't also be naive thinking, okay, I will go and talk with all these people and, and a harmony will come as a result of that. And maybe you enter and they tell you, well, you know, the lineage of Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati is not bona fide and you cannot attain perfection in that particular lineage. And you, what you will do there, no? I mean, no need to try to jump on them and attack them physically. You may have a conversation, but they may end up being convinced, no, that lineage is not bona fide. And, and you will be convinced of the opposite. So you may realize, okay, with this particular person, I cannot continue the conversation because that person is convinced that the people I love are deviants, probably. And that, that let's be honest, that creates some, some difference. So you cannot just force harmony in that situation. You just need to let go of controlling the outcome and offer some respectful distance and, and continuing that. So, and again, you will always find this like Srila Siddharth will say, weak faith requires an enemy, right? So when, when our faith is not so strong, again, I need, my faith is mostly sustained on how ugly you are, so to say, <laughs> how ugly the other, the other group is. And that's why I'm here. I'm here because you are so bad. I'm not here because this is so good, but because that's so bad that I don't want to be there, <laughs> so to say. And then I spend my time criticizing the other party, so to say. So weak faith requires an enemy. But when our faith grows, you realize ultimately there are no enemies. And even those we may differ from, you see them with other understanding, with compassion, even if externally we may need to take some distance, respectful distance from their opinions, no? Like, like recently I was in, invited to give a lecture in a few months when I will be in Europe and, and and, and, and recently I was re-invited re in that context that I could give a lecture with two other speakers, one of them being a person that that I personally know that have said some things, basically criticizing Srila Prabhupada and regarding the Bhakti Not Parivar. So I had to basically take my stance there no? and say, okay, I, I respect that person. I'm not judging or condemning that person and i don't know the person personally i only know that these things were said and i listened to them firsthand so it's not that it's a hearsay so for me that's enough to not wanting to be given a class together with that person <laughs> it's not that i'm angry that i will insult him that i will go on a campaign i'm not even mentioning his name here publicly but but i have to take my stance i have my loyalties so to say I have my loyalties, not in a fanatical way, not in a, hopefully, <laughs> but just, I, again, going to the previous question, I have some personal experience in the Bhakti no Parivar, which made me conclude this is bona fide, this is this, this, this. So if someone thinks differently, okay, you can have your opinion, but that will naturally create a distance. That happens, that's life, no? On a more ontological level, yeah, every soul is loved by Krishna unconditionally. I acknowledge that. I honor that. <laughs> but on the other level, we may have to take some distance from certain people. That's what Rupa Goswami says in Uvadesamrita. That's the criterion that a Madhyam Bhakta has to develop, how to relate with different peoples, how to relate with God. No? You love God. You have friendship with other Vaishnavs. You, you are compassionate with, so to say, innocent people. And you may need to take a distance from some people who may be envious or criticizing. So we we need to know how to relate in every possible direction. And so, yeah, that's what I will say, Madhav, in that connection. I don't know if that helps. Yes, Maharaj, thank you so much, Maharaj. Helps a lot. A few bits are remaining. I'll ask you personally later. Yes, thank you. So that's it. We have Rasangi raising her hand. So please... I know, but it's late, Maharaj. It's so late. Do you want to go on or do you? Oh, can... you Next time. Tania Sadahari. We want to go on forever. Oh, I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. 
Yeah, I was thinking what Maud was saying, act locally and think globally. Like just, I love what you say, give people an experience of unconditional love that they've never had before. And that is the best preaching we can do. You know what I mean? Bring understanding, compassion, but draw the limits. So I love that. But um, I had a response to Martina and in the first canto, second chapter, you know, it, it's introduced to Parmat was introduced. And in the purport of 33, Prabhupada says, the Lord is paramount, my helps the living being to get material happiness because the living being is helpless in all respects. In obtaining what he desires, he proposes, meaning us and the Lord disposes. Now, if that's not loving, I don't know what is. Like so much love, Krishna accompanies us here, is in our heart, and he's even doing for us what we can't do to help us try to be happy, and in the end, know that this is not going to bring happiness and turn to him. I was just thinking, that's a nice section of the Bhagavatam that describes the introduction of Paramatma in the material creation. Mm -hmm. But my question was, um, we talked about repression and suppression and depression in um, um, the book. An individuation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, um, it's so powerful and so important, you know, but when we're coming to be more alive, we're allowing ourselves to become more, come out of deep freeze, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, becoming more uh, alive to who we are, because we, that's our job is to be who we are. Um, you know, it's a, can make it difficult, it's confusing, it's like risky. But I know in good association, when we feel safe, we can do that and learn how to do it. And then we bring it out to the rest of the world, right? Yeah. But um, you talk about the, and I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about this suppression, pushing away feelings, emotions, repression, pushing them into the unconsciousness and then depression coming. This is so beautiful how you describe the immune system, the emotional mm. immune system. Mm. Can you talk about that a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, we can say something <laughs> always. Uh, but yeah, I, I would talk about that as you mentioned. I, I see that you are going through the chapter on individuation from, from radical personalism, um, which, yeah, it's one all it may sound a little bit narcissistic, but I will say it, it's one of my favorite chapters. <laughs> uh, again, it's not about my own being writing that book, but just, yeah, these are important topics, basically. And, and basically, you're referring to a section where we are talking about, yeah, as you say, repression, suppression, and depression. And and we, we we use that example of the immune system, right? Like the, the role of the immune system is to protect our, our physical body from, from invasion, so to say, by setting proper boundaries, no? defense boundaries. Uh, so when we repress our emotions, mm -hmm. uh, the emotional immune system, as you refer, and I think I refer also, uh, protects our subtle, subtle body from invasion, quote unquote, or evasion <laughs> in the form of depression, right? So it, it, the result is it, it turns against us, basically. So so it's interesting for me, for me the very first discoveries were like, wow, it's interesting to see the connection between repression and depression be, be, besides semantics, right? Because the word sounds, it's basically the same word with one letter difference, but, but yeah, that's how it works. And that's a good way of understanding uh, depression, because many times depression, it's just, okay, I'm depressed, I feel depressed, and I go to my therapist or whatever, I receive my treatment, or I take the pill, and that's it. But, but we, we don't get what's the causal factor there. No? Re depression, in one sense, is more like a symptom of, of, of what's going on. No? So you are deep, deep depression, no? like trying to put down <laughs> something 
that needs to come up, you know, that needs to be expressed, not to be repressed. But the more we insist, whether consciously, unconsciously, generally, we insist as, um, on not be on not being confronted with our shadow in Jungian terms, and uh, probably depression will will become as a result of that. No, depression in that way serves as an indicator <laughs> of, of our evasiveness. And again, I'm not saying that to 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 to, to invoke feelings of guilt or shame, because again, many of these processes are going on unconsciously. <laughs> So then is the importance of bringing consciousness to the unconscious, no? like bringing awareness to those inner movements that are taking place without us being uh, looking in that direction. So the very fact that we are talking about the things is like, oh, it, it sheds some light on processes that may be already happening in the darkness, so to say. So, so I think to begin with, that's very important to understand it. And all of us somehow feel have experienced depression. Depression doesn't just necessarily mean I want to kill myself. You no, know? <laughs> there are so many degrees of that. So, so, so whenever that comes, it's important to know immediately to connect that. Okay, there is something here that wants to be expressed, and without knowing it, I'm not allowing that to happen. So that same thing comes in this form now. <laughs> no, the depression, the depression feeling is coming. Uh, for it's basically what I'm repressing comes in the form of depression. So it's still coming, but in a way that sometimes I just see it as a symptom that needs to be like dealt with instead that of some emotion that needs to be expressed. And of course, I'm not professional clinical therapist and I'm not trying here to replace that and to speak like if I were, <laughs> but I'm of course trying to talk on the basis of of clinical findings in this connection and, and, and clear patterns that have been established on research and so on. So I think that for all of us, it's important to deal with these things because again, most of us are not free from these moments, but the point is we need to ascertain them for what they are because if, if, if the problem quote unquote comes and you think that the problem is something else, you are creating a, another problem basically. So if depression comes, but you don't understand what's depression, and you take depression for something for that is not, then that's a problem. <laughs> the depression becomes a secondary problem at that moment. And your misreading of what depression is becomes the main problem because you misread depression and then you try to address depression for what it's not. And that creates a whole layer of new problem instead of addressing the root cause, what's behind depression, and, and trying to, to contact your feelings, contact your emotions, like as, as I mentioned also in my book, to culture emotional intimacy. Because many of us are deprived of that. Many of us are not like very much in touch with our emotional depths. Because of course, there is, there is shame behind that many times. There is fear. There is so many of these negative emotions in, in going there, in confronting what's there. And, and, and again, many very deeply, many times there is loss of shame because unconsciously we may be convinced that we are flawed, we are not lovable, we are not good. And whenever those things come, they kind of confirm that to us. So we don't want those confirmations. <laughs> so we just keep pushing down, pushing down, pushing down, but that worsens the problem. So instead of that, we need to, again, address the whole thing by the root and understand to begin with, I'm not ontologically bad. <laughs> I'm not ontologically unlovable. There's no need for, for being a shame-based person. I need to deconstruct that myth. And I need to understand how I'm loved unconditionally by God, how I'm, as a unit of spiritual existence, I'm worthy of that, as Krishna says in the Gita, Charyabhat, the soul is wonderful. I need to focus my sense of identity and identification in that direction and through prayer, through repetition, through ritual, through whatever it helps to bring me to that place of who I actually am. So whatever comes in terms of emotions that need to be expressed, whatever emotional waters are being agitated there, I can open myself more to that, deal with that instead of resorting to putting them under the rough. So to say I'm of and an increasing the problem and creating newer layers of depression, delusion, denial, bypassing, 
indifference and we will come more and more like foreign to our inner landscape, so to say, instead of cultivating this emotional intimacy that we need so much to remain humans. And again, in one sense, it all goes back to humanity. <laughs> we have to reclaim our humanity. We have to redeem our humanity. Mm -hmm. We have to become fully human because we, we cannot be, in our tradition, we cannot attain full perfection if we are not fully human and fully divine. So we have to integrate these two layers. So part of that process, part of our sadhana, let's say, is to deal with our emotions in, in a proper way. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's good that we understand that as part of our bhakti project, not like it's some separate thing that has nothing to do with devotional life. No, no, all is in potentially integrative, so to say. So uh, I like that what you said about um, and not only do you develop, you try to hide, you develop addictions. You try to fill that with something artificial. So it's mm -hmm. like really important to understand and become intimate or allow the emotions. But you also said, like with Jada Bharat, he recognized his anger, but he neglected that. So it's not that we have to stay in those emotions either. No. We have to recognize them and either do something with them. We can, but we choice. But it's a choice. We may, we take action to yeah. make a better plan to make a plan maybe yeah How yeah, yeah. I like, yeah. That. like i remember i mentioned the book we, we are not supposed to sit on our emotions but sit with our emotions but that doesn't mean that we will be sitting perpetually again as you mentioned we will allow ourselves acknowledge the emotion like yeah. honor it honor its presence so to say if you want to invoke a more sacred language <laughs> uh and 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 deal with that properly and, and, and that in itself will become something else, so to say. Now, what was originally shame or whatever, by acknowledging it, by dealing with that properly, it will acquire its its original face, so to say. And it and it can it will become something that I coexist I can coexist with forever. No. I can I cannot coexist forever with toxic shame, but I can coexist forever with a healthy sense of shame. There is place for that. That will set proper boundaries in terms of how I should behave. Mm. But 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 I may need first to sit with my toxic shame, confront that, realize its toxicity, <laughs> and, 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 and transform that, if you will, into its healthy version. And and that I can continue having a conversation with that version of it, so to say. <laughs> but but yeah, first of all comes the acknowledgement. No, if I do not accept the existence of that thing i mean i'm just living like if that does not exist i'm living a life of denial and indifference and that creates its own dysfunction so and it goes beyond this topic it goes up on everything first before solving anything you have to acknowledge its existence so to say <laughs> because we live like so many things do not exist including krishna <laughs> So many times we live like Krishna does not exist. So what 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 can we talk about all that comes after? First, acknowledge his existence. And that's not merely verbally. God exists. L live up, live, 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 live out your beliefs, basically. Play out your beliefs. I believe that Krishna exists. Okay, behave accordingly. Because I can say Krishna exists and I can engage in what I call in my book functional atheism, which is God exists, but I conduct myself like if he doesn't exist. We are all in part in that journey on some level. Let's be honest and let's be, let's normalize that a little bit so that it doesn't feel like I'm whipping each of you with my words. <laughs> but but that's happening. We are There is some part of us which is still atheists at times during the day, impersonalist at times during the day. So we were saying, sahaja or this or that, not to over identify that, but to acknowledge the existence of that. So once we acknowledge that, we can deal with that pro properly. And the acknowledgement period may take more time than what we think sometimes. <laughs> and so and we should spend the, all the time we need to acknowledge what needs to be acknowledged, and then the necessary time to deal with what we have acknowledged and so on and so forth. So, oh, anyhow. Amazing, um, amazing, Mahash. And I wanted to say that 
what I what it is is a current of truth. When we hear the truth, we know it. That's what's so uh, exciting and attractive when truth comes to us, descends, or we can all, we can, we become attracted. There's part of us that knows truth, capital T, right? Yeah. Not just wiser or elders. We, we sense the truth there. Yeah. And that attracts our hearts. Yeah. And that, that's in one sense the beginning of our path, not to be honest. And honest has to do with truth telling. I'm not only willing to tell the truth, but I'm willing to hear the truth. Even when it's uncomfortable, it's painful. And and again, I'm willing to witness the truth in terms of my emotions coming. I need to acknowledge them for what they are. That's truth telling. So we have to engage in truth telling in every possible direction. And that means to be honest. If we are not honest, we have not begun the journey yet. And as we say, Krishna will say, even if you behave terribly and you're a mess, but you are honest. You have not only begun the journey, you're a sadhu for me, Krishna says in the Gita. So he puts so much emphasis on honesty. Honesty, honesty, honesty. And honesty, again, means the willingness for confrontation. Confrontation in terms to be confronted with truth. Whatever shape it takes. Sometimes it will be more joyful, more uplifting. Sometimes it will be crushing, uncomfortable, overwhelming, a mystery. <laughs> Truth is many things. But to keep the willingness to be confronted with truth. I only want the truth, basically. No, I don't, no matter the packaging, how it has to come, I only want the truth. That's my like the Chakora spirit. No, like these famous mythological birds only are taken the Chakora is or the or the Chataka bird. You have the two of them. The Chataka bird is the one who only survives by drinking the water coming from the rain. So the, the spirit of the bird is, even if nothing comes, I may die, I may be thirsty, but I only want what comes from above. I'm, I'm not taking anything from anywhere else. I only want the truth, basically. I want to be confronted with truth. Even, even if I die without receiving that, I prefer to die looking for truth <laughs> and not finding it that dying in some other way, so to say. You know, so that, that's kind of the spirit. I only want the truth. I only want truth to be my diet, so to say. <laughs> truth telling, honesty. As much as I can sustain, again, nothing unsustainable, extreme, fanatical, but just to culture that, that willingness, that determination. I want to be confronted by truth always. And, and trusting that truth is ultimately a blessing. That's what I need. That's my diet. Um, and of course, satsanga means that, basically, you know, to get in touch with honesty. Satsanga, sat means what is real, what is true. Sangha also can mean attachment. So satsanga means attachment to being honest. So satsanga is that type of circle in which you feel that that's development. We are developing together an attachment for truth telling. We are developing, we are contagion one another with the tendency to be honest. And we, we want nothing apart from that. We don't want cheating, performance, external stuff, duality. We want to truth telling. That's a healthy confrontation, loving confrontation. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, some thoughts. We are almost two hours, so I think we, we can stop here. It has been our longest session so far, I think, but it was worth it the time. That's the best way to spend our time in, like the Bhagavatam says. Which is setting and appearing and disappearing of the sun. Time is passing and life is taken away. But if someone is engaging in this type of conversations, nothing is taken away, but all is being given. So the passing of time has been pushing us closer and closer to our goal in this case. So I'm, I'm very blessed and fortunate to be able to spend have spent these last two hours with all of you in Satsanga. Thank you so much for blessing me in that way. And sorry, I have an alarm here, as you can hear <laughs> every hour. So we'll conclude here. Um, Sri Sachinandan Gaur Hari Ki Jai. Sri Hari Nam Sankirtan Ki Jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. Gaur Pramananda Haribu. And just inviting you before you leave, these days we'll have a few lectures in case you have time, of course. Tomorrow in the morning uh, at 
9 a.m. EDT time, if I'm not mistaken, you, Bhaktarasa, connect correctly. There will be a friend of mine, Bhaktarasak Swami Maharaj from Austria. He will be exposing um, back to ABC and connecting with human nature and bhakti as part of our Tadatmya lecture series. So if you have time to connect, it will be, again, live, Zoom, streaming, um, also shared in the Facebook of Tadatmya, but he's a friend of mine. I think you will appreciate his words as well, very special soul. And also on Monday, we'll be sharing a new episode of the Free Radical Podcast, in this case with Sudharma Dasi, a Srila Prabhupada disciple who has been very involved in, 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 how to say, different things. One of them also nourishing the position of woman in the society of Vaishnavas and many other very exemplary projects. And we talked, uh, and, and she was one who coined the term radical personalism before I did, but I didn't know. I came to know it after I wrote my book. So we'll be talking about radical personalism and also from approaching its nemesis, so to say, impersonalism. So the title of our conversation will be the true face, if I'm not mistaken, the true face of impersonalism. So that will be on this Monday in two days. So hopefully you can also connect for that. And if not, see you all hopefully next Saturday for another session of exchanging of hearts in East Agosti. So thank you so much. Sri Sri Gaur Adamadar Ki Jai, Sri Gaur Nitinanda Ki Jai, Gaur Gadadar Ki Jai, Sadhu Sangha Ki Jai, Gaur Primanand Haribo. Haribo, Haribo. Kripa Sindhu Vyeva Chapati.